All right, everyone, Joe Correa, Solutions Engineer. And today I'll be presenting the from C SPM to CNAP. So let me go ahead and get my screens right here. Uh, and we're gonna be talking about defining a new operating model for cloud security. And you're likely already familiar with the acronym CSPM, but in case you're not, it sounds for Cloud Security Foster Management. And its main purpose was to detect misconfigurations in the cloud. I'm sure we can all think about at least a few horror stories of publicly exposed S3 buckets that leaks customer data, right? Due to a, a misconfiguration. So let's talk about uh, how do we get from CSPM to CNAP? And CNAP stands for Cloud Native Application Protection Platform. And let's take a look at some examples here. So here we have a legacy CSPM solution and we've been alerted. A virtual machine has a public IP address. And so of course, this type of alert will kick the security team into gear and they'll begin their investigation efforts only to find out that there is no internet gateway and there's so, there is no actual routing to the internet. So we've kind of wasted our efforts here on, uh, based on this alert. We have another example here. We have unrestricted SSH access tied to an access control list, right? A firewall. And again, uh, the security team would kick into gear here and they would begin their investigation efforts. And just like before, uh, those efforts would uh, come be fruitless, right? There's no internet gateway, so there's no actual routing to the internet. And so therefore this alert was kind of meaningless. And in our next example here, we actually have the lack of an alert. So this virtual machine does not have an IP, so uh, public IP, so the CSPM never alerted. But if we take a closer look at the virtual machine, we actually see that there's a load balancer and that there is in fact a network path to the virtual machine. And so we kind of uh, lacked a, or, or missed an alert there. And this is what you would typically see with a legacy CSPM solution. Uh, and we're starting to see a trend, right? We're starting to see a trend of lacking context. The first two examples resulted in a misconfiguration alert that had no potential impact to the business. And the last example was uh, the lack of an alert where there was a potential impact to the business. So it's not uncommon for a CSPM tool to have hundreds of alerts like the ones we just saw, which lacked context that would, be, would have been useful to determine where to prioritize our efforts. So overall, this can be overwhelming and lead security teams to alert fatigue. And let's kind of take a look at this from a different perspective. So we have uh, cloud native attacks that are evolving very quickly. Uh, these attack paths look all similar starting with that initial cloud access. Once there's that initial cloud access, then there's lateral movement throughout the cloud estate. And then once there's uh, that lateral movement, then the actor is able to uh, get access to the crown jewels of an organization. And the initial cloud access comes at a few different variations of risk, right? It's not just simply a misconfiguration that could lead to lateral movement. In fact, there are uh, various uh, risk vectors that can be uh, used to gain that initial cloud access. So we're all familiar with the log for shell incident of a couple of years ago. That was a RCE via vulnerability, but you also have the possibility for a misconfigured application. Uh, next, we have misconfigured cloud resources and user compromise through social engineering. Uh, we're all familiar with that. And then also the potential for supply chain incidents, right? And all of these are the way that malicious actors can gain that initial access to the cloud. Once they have that initial access, then they move into internal exposure and isolation breakout. And that also takes on a variety of different uh, forms, right? We have uh, the potential for an insecure use of secrets. So once a malicious actor is in the cloud of state, they then discover a secret and that secret could allow them to move laterally and not just laterally between a single cloud provider, but potentially even laterally uh, across multiple different cloud providers based on the type of secret that it is. You also have identity connectivity and of course, excessive privileges, right? Identity is a new perimeter that very much is the case. If you have excessive privileges, you have the ability to move laterally throughout the organization. And it's the combination of these, the initial access to the cloud and the internal exposure and isolation breakout that creates a toxic combination of risk, right? So what are the challenges with a traditional CSPM solution? Um, first, we have a lack of context. Legacy CSPM checks are often binary in nature. They can be answered with a simple yes or no. So you can think something like, is logging enabled true? Uh, is encryption enforced false? Is there internet exposure true, right? It's very binary in nature. Uh, and what we're lacking there is the context about other risk vectors. So the lack of context leads to noise uh, without prioritization 
you may end up with hundreds of alerts, but without correlation to other risk vectors, there's simply no way to prioritize, right? If we find a misconfiguration and that misconfiguration is on a resource that also has a critical vulnerability with an exploit, well, that allows us to understand and prioritize that issue uh, before a simple misconfiguration that's kind of isolated, right? It's always a combination of multiple risk vectors or risk angles uh, that should be prioritized at an organization. And lastly, uh, legacy CSPM tools create operational efficiencies. So it's not uncommon for an organization to have a CSPM tool, a vulnerability scanner, a secret scanner, and a data security tool, all of which create a fragmented view of the overall security posture. Not to mention the difficulty around creating processes for each tool. At the end of the day, of the day all this ends with a lot of manual triangulation and inefficiencies. So we need a new approach to CSPM. And that's where we introduced kind of the cloud security needs a new operating model. And that operating model is one unified platform for many cloud security use cases. So the Wiz CNAP solution is a complete platform that fully integrates all of these security domains under a single platform. You can see that we consider the, the uh, risk signals from the CSPM uh, module with the risk signals from vulnerability management, container security, cloud detection and response. All of this is coming together under, under the same data model and the same platform, which allows for a quicker um, uh, operationalization of the platform, right? If everything is coming from a single place, uh, then we understand how to prioritize risk. So with our Wiz, uh, with Wiz, our CSPM module provides the most context possible because again, we're taking in the risk signals from all of those different uh, modules that we, we just saw on the previous scheme, uh, screen. And we correlate these risks on a security graph, which allows us to visualize and understand what risks to prioritize. All of this come, comes together under a single platform uh, and one tool that secures everything from your development environment all the way to your production. And really, here's a customer. Uh, there's nothing better than the words of a customer, which uh, we have Ashley here who said, Wiz is much more than a CSPM provider. It checks a lot of other boxes, vulnerability scanning on the disk images, container scanning, perimeter scanning, it saves us all from having to buy all these other tools. So let's see how Wiz actually does all of this, um, looking at, at it from the perspective of the platform. So everything begins with a completely agentless scan of your cloud configuration, as well as your workloads. Uh, so that agentless scan will allow us to gain a full inventory of all the different resources that, are, uh, that exist across your cloud estate. So every single serverless function, every container, every virtual machine, Every database, every technology that's being leveraged within that cloud estate is going to be placed into our inventory. And that's all going to be done through an agentless scan, which gives the product extreme uh, time to value. Right. Once we have that agentless scan, uh, then we're able to map out all of those different resources onto our graph database. And not only do we map the resources onto the graph database, but we start to uh, create the relationship between those resources and map that out as well. So here you can see the relationship between the internet gateway and the virtual machine, as well as the uh, role that's used uh, to operate that virtual machine. Once we have that full inventory of uh, and full mapping of the relationship between the different resources, that's when we go ahead and layer on our own uh, risk scans, right? And the risk scans will identify risks across misconfigurations, vulnerabilities, malware, sensitive data, external exposure, all the items that you see list, uh, listed on the left. And we can see that here on, on the screen, right? Once we have the full inventory of all the different resources running in the cloud, then we laid on the security scan and that discovered a misconfiguration tied to a security group. We have a critical vulnerability on a virtual machine. We've also discovered an exposed secret as well as malware. And we also have an understanding that the role associated to the virtual machine has excessive permissions. So here, what we're able to see is a lot of context about each and every uh, risk signal, right? We understand that the, the critical vulnerability is tied to a virtual machine that is also has exposure on the internet. And then we know that the virtual machine is also tied to a role that has excessive access meaning that if the virtual machine was compromised, the actor could take advantage of the role and then move laterally through the environment because of their excessive access. Once we've uh, gone ahead and uh, identified all the different risks, the next piece is to help prioritize which risk is, is the most important to, uh, to prioritize, right? So here we've seen, uh, 
we've identified an attack path. And that attack path is showing that a malicious actor can go from the internet through the internet gateway and uh, different networking resources onto the virtual machine, gain access to the IAM role that has excessive access, and then un uh, move laterally to the database that's storing, that's storing PII information or the crown jewels of an organization. So now that we've identified the attack path, we know where to prioritize our efforts. Uh, but to do that, we have to understand what team to prioritize the efforts for, right? Not every team should be inundated with this alert because it simply may not uh, be tied to uh, the user's uh, um, resources that they own. So here we've identified that a team A is not the one responsible for this particular, uh, this particular binding here. And so what we'll need to do is we'll need to prioritize this for team C, right? Team C should be the one that receives the alert about this uh, critical risk, right? And the critical risk, of course, is that attack path analysis. Okay, once we've identified the appropriate team uh, to deliver the information to, then what we can do is we can leverage our integrations to make sure that we deliver all of the context that we just saw to the appropriate team. Oops, looks like it got a little bit ahead of ourselves here. Okay, so now what I wanna do is actually take a moment to go into the actual Wiz product and just kind of show the example uh, coming out of the product instead of these slides. So let me go ahead and pull that up here and then we can take a look at that. Okay. So here we have our class, classic toxic combination of risk. And at the center of this uh, toxic combination, we have an AWS EC2 instance, and we can tell that by the, the little marker here. Um, and let's go ahead and, and begin to tell a story about this risk. So first off, what we have is this virtual machine has internet exposure, and we know that based on the configuration of the networking resources. So we have an understanding of the relationship between the internet gateway and this uh, virtual machine. Right, there's an internet gateway tied to a VPC, tied to a subnet, then a network interface that uh, allows us to see the uh, path to the internet. Once Joe, we we're see... still seeing your PowerPoint. Oh, no. Uh, yeah, okay. Okay. Do you have a second screen or anything or? Yeah, let me just see if I can. Okay. Thanks for pointing that out. Yeah. Okay. okay. Can you see this now? Uh, we can see, yeah, you're moving. It says the internet, and then you've got the strings go or lines going across. Yeah, exactly. Okay, great. So let's uh, go ahead and, and talk about this toxic combination of risk here um, that was prioritized, right? So what we're seeing here is a virtual machine at the center of this uh, toxic combination or at the center of this issue. And this virtual machine, uh, we've validated that there's internet exposure to this virtual machine. And we've done that by analyzing the networking resources. So we can see how the, the relationship between the internet gateway and the virtual machine through the network interface, the subnet, and then as well as the VPC. So now that we have an understanding that the virtual machine um, has that internet exposure, We've also identified that there are a few uh, vulnerabilities on that virtual machine. And these vulnerabilities may be critical in nature and have a network uh, attack vector, right? So we can then understand that uh, an actor can gain access to this virtual machine through the networking components, the networking resources, then uh, leverage one of these uh, vulnerabilities, critical vulnerabilities, and uh, then exploit the machine and compromise the machine, right? Maybe it's like a log for shell or something similar. So once they've uh, exploited that vulnerability, then what we're able to see is that the, there's also a uh, AWS IAM role that's tied to this virtual machine. And we know that this virtual, this uh, AWS IAM role has excessive permissions or at least admin permissions because we're able to see the crown here. And so now that the malicious actor has exploited the vulnerability. They can then gain access to this AWS IAM role, which can then lead them to a, a different virtual machine through lateral movement. And then that lateral movement uh, can then show that uh, that lateral movement can then move to access to sensitive data. And we see that here at the top, right? We see personal sensitive data, 
uh, that is uh, protected through GDPR. So this is kind of your toxic combination of risk because what we've seen here is uh, you know, multiple different risk vectors, uh, one being the network, two being the vulnerability, the excess of permissions, as well as the access to sensitive data. And with that, that kind of concludes what I was talking about today.